Good evening, my people. Good evening, my people. Uh, I'm going to get started in a minute. I'm going to give some people some time to come in. I'm also checking my internet connection. So in the meantime, I'm just going to play some, some music for you um, while I just check this connection. I have the worst internet. Okie dokie. Good, e good evening, those of you who are watching and those who are going to watch a little bit later. I've been wanting to do this, uh, 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 I guess, episode for a little while, um, talking about President Paul Kagame, president of Rwanda, why people don't like him, all the reasons that go into uh, why he's like a polarizing figure in the world to some people he's seen as a good guy to others he's seen as some type of uh, dictator we're gonna get into it okay over the next hour so let me just uh, go through it all a couple of things i wanted to talk about a couple of announcements first of all if you are an african person who grew up in the usa just send me a message please uh, either in the comments or wherever just send me a message because i'm very curious to know um who you are and i'd like to do a show where i'm talking to Africans who grew up in the USA. I won't say why just yet, but I'm very curious to get you on, on the show. Secondly, uh, I'm going to start a membership thing. Eventually, no, yeah, I'm going to ease it in with time. I think I need to build a little bit more. Uh, but we're going to start a mem membership tier. It's probably going to be about two, I think it's two ninety nine or one ninety nine. I can't remember. Uh, and it's for those of you who really support. I've got a whole bunch of documentaries about to drop. And um, some of you have been very patriotic and i'd like you guys to have first dibs uh and of course you know we need to keep this channel growing so please 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 support where you can okay so those are the announcements now we're talking about rwanda and if you don't know where rwanda is it's a little where are we now if you don't know where rwanda is there's a map there's a map that shows exactly where it is. Really, really tiny country in what you would call cent Central Africa, I guess. So if you look at the that red spot, that red spot is around the great, not far from the Great Lakes region. So the, Cong the country to the, direct, uh, to the left of it is Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, Kigali is the capital. Current population of Rwanda is sits at approximately 12. Let me try and put both screens up uh population sits at about 12 million people official official languages as of now are kenya rwanda uh french up until really around 2005 uh, and then english although people still speak french now i'll get into the, the reason why we have those uh, three languages uh the current currency is the rwandan franc the area you know it's very tiny as you can see from the map and they got their independence in 1962 from the Belgians. Okay, now Rwanda is most known for 
depending on where you are, it's most known for a couple of things. But probably the most popular of everything is the Rwandan genocide. The Rwandan genocide that took place in 1994 is the the primary reason people know about Rwanda, okay? Uh, Where up to a million people were murdered, um, which is a pretty, 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 pretty horrible sight. Okay, so let me just go into a bit more detail and then I'll get started with the show. So here we have an image of the king. What was the last king? There's still a king at the moment. Just like many parts of Africa, there's still rulers. There's still people that are there at the moment. There's still people that are ruling, but their their power doesn't work in a democracy. Okay, so they're essentially uh, they're essentially like uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? They're basically people. They're basically figureheads, um, uh, cultural figureheads. Okay, now it's very interesting to understand this story. So Rwanda, so remember the Berlin Conference happens in 1884, right? Even up until the Berlin Conference, the two, the, you had two, you essentially have three ethnic groups that, that, that reside in Rwanda. You have the Tutsi, which my, uh, I'm half Tutsi, and then you have the Hutu. Then you also have the Twa, okay? Now, in terms of population, the Twa are about 1%. The Twa essentially are the people who, um, you could actually make a link and say they're the oldest people that exist. The Twa, the so-called uh, small people, if you will. Some of them are some so-called small people. And you have the Hutu, who are the majority in Rwanda, and you have the Tutsi, who are about 14, 14%. Now, at the time that the Belgians, were, first of all, the Germans were coming in, what happened was that they were basically, they basically used the Tutsi ruling class, which was already the ruling class, to uh, uh, control the Hutus, who were the essential the majority. Now, the, the Tutsis ruled as, as the ruling class prior to that, um, they were seen as, you know, these, 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 these tall people, if you will. But the, 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 the Germans, and when they were eventually lost after the First World War, it was taken over by Belgium, they took it to a next level. They took it to another level where they said to them, we're going to actually measure people's, you know, craniums. We're going to look at the width of people's noses, and we're going to judge who the Tutsis are. So they essentially used the Tutsis because the Tutsis, in their eyes, were closer to white people in terms of their facial features, their uh, uh, phenotype, etc., so they would have the long, the people that had the long noses, the tall, slender bodies, and the people who look more Negroid, which is a very, very bizarre thing because they were all Negroid. They all speak the same language. They all look, they're all pretty much the same African people. But here we have the final, the last king. And I just want, to, want you to see what he looks like. All right. The last great king. Uh, of course, the Catholics, of course, they come in, the Catholic missionaries, they come in and create even more division. Okay, they create more division because Belgium in itself, Belgium in itself is not a, uh, is also a a, a multicultural nation. So you have the Flemish people, you have the French people, uh, and um, you know the various others, but those two 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 main ones. And what they did was they created a division amongst the people because they some sided with the Hutus, some sided with the Tutsis, and this created a problem later down the line because as we go on, as we go on in the story of uh, of 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 of, of uh, Rwanda, uh, we start to see these ethnic these divisions that they create and exacerbate become even worse and create even more friction amongst the people who've been living, you know, for the most part in relative harmony since uh, since their since since the beginning of since the beginning of their time as a nation. Now it's very important. And let me just go back a couple of slides. So, to just next to Rwanda. Just next to Rwanda is a country called Burundi. Burundi in itself is also similar. Uh, it, was, it was similarly put together. But in, in Burundi, you have a majority Tutsi population and a minority Hutu population. Okay? So it wasn't necessarily done in the inverse, but the, certainly population-wise, the, Hutus outnum- the Tutsis outnumbered the Hutus in Burundi. So the problems that would later arrive in Ru- arise in Rwanda don't show up in the same way. They show up in a different way later, but we'll we'll come to that. So let me just go back or go forward. So my mother is uh, born in Rwanda, and uh, around the year 1959, as the Belgians were getting ready, this is the rise of, 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 of nationalism across Africa. So 1957, or really 1956, Guinea, Ghana, and Egypt would start to separate from their colonial... Uh, rulers who were European, they would start to separate. And everybody could see that the tide was turning. Okay, the following year, 
uh, I think, uh, what would later be called the Democratic Republic of Congo or Zaire, Belgian Congo, would eventually become independent. Now, the, the, the 1959, my mother and various other Tutsi, members of the Tutsi minority, uh, would start to go through a different kind of oppression because it, you know it's almost like the the Rwanda, the South Africa episode. If you look at what's happening, what happened in South Africa during the apartheid regime, you had the minority ruling over the majority, and so as soon as there were going to be free and fair elections where people were going to be allowed to vote, what you quickly saw is the Europeans started fleeing. They started fleeing. Uh, but the, the 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 black people in South Africa were not going out and killing the white people as a revenge. Not certainly not in large numbers. You don't see anything like Soweto massacre, etc. But you but but they see that the tide is turning and there's a general fear that this is going to happen. But in Rwanda, in this case, the Tutsis recognize our power is dwindling. As soon as we have elections, we are going to be in trouble. And so many of them started to flee. But certainly, many of them really started to flee when they saw. That the, Hutu, that the Hutus were beginning to have the power to go and essentially uh, kill people. And what we had is what they call, there are different names for it, they call it the Hutu Peasant Revolt or the Social Revolution. And this was essentially an uprising of Hutu people where thousands of Tutsis were killed and many, like my mother and like President Kagame, what would be President Kagame, I think he's born 1957 or 58, 57 I think, would flee to neighboring countries, in many cases to Uganda, right next to it. Uganda. Uganda is the president, sorry, is the country where you have Yoweri Museveni now. Uh, it's also where Idi Amin, nation where Idi Amin was from. So many people, many Tutsis grew up as refugees in places like uh, Burundi and also in Uganda, including uh, my mother. Okay. Uh, for those of you who are watching, just give me a one if the if, you, if the internet's good, if the Wi-Fi is good, just give me a one. I just want to be sure that this is working. Actually, let me just do a quick check. Let me just do a quick check and make sure it's all good. Yes, it looks good. Got a good internet connection today. This is good. Okay, back to it. So, uh, now, again, so uh, we have numbers that, that go up to about 330,000 uh, that went to seek refuge in Rwanda. Now, at this time, obviously, the population is significantly smaller than it is now. Now, of course, uh, they eventually have independence in 1962, 1962, and the Hutus, the Hutu power, essentially, the, this concept of Hutu power, which you see in movies like Hotel Rwanda, where they're chanting Hutu power, Hutu power, this is where it starts to begin. Now, this Hutu power is basically signifying the end of Tutsi rule the beginning of Hutu power. And what you had is from 1962, really up until uh, the year 2000, you had Hutu rulership in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Rwanda. Galactic Soul, good to see you. Thank you very much for that. All right. Now, we're still talking about Paul Kagame. Keep that in mind. This is not about Rwanda per se, but I need to lay the foundation about what's going on in the country and in his life, okay? So Paul Kagame is one of the many refugees, like my mother, that fled to Uganda. And my mother, like, like him, were raised as Ugandans. Do you, the, the, I suppose main nationality being Ugandan, and then obviously of Rwandese heritage. So Paul Kagame grows up there. And of course we see, for those of you who have seen movies like The Last King of Scotland, and you can see the image there of Idi Amin, or Forrest Whitaker playing Idi Amin, but, and by the way, The Last King of Scotland is a heavily fictitious film. The character of Nicholas Garrigan, if you read the book, not just if you read the book, he just never existed. Never existed, but this is something which, is, uh, I don't know what kind of, I don't know the kind of arrogance that people have that they just think that we could just create this fictitious character to go and try and show this despotic leader in Africa. I mean, it's just, the way they, these, anyway, let me not talk too much. Anyway. So if you remember, in, uh, Idi Amin takes over, takes over in a coup, in a military coup. He's essentially backed by the British army. He served during the colonial period as a British uh, soldier, um, uh, I think under the Scottish, Scottish, Scottish regiment, um, and British back him to take over uh, for Milton Obote. Now, Milton Obote is still uh, galvanizing his troops in the uh, and, and obviously goes to uh, the bushes to go and try and remobilize, which is 
what people were doing at the time. So eventually, if you see the story of Last King of Scotland, but also there's a good movie they made, I think. No, there's no good movie about uh, 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 Idi Amin. They're all pretty silly. But the story of Idi Amin is he eventually flees uh, when Obote's men come and reconquer uh, um, um, Uganda. And I think Idi Amin goes eventually and, and goes into exile in Saudi Arabia. But Idi Amin's character, when he's deposed by Milton Obote, Milton Obote actually does it using troops, using largely troops who feel a sense of loyalty, obviously, to Milton Obote, but then also troops that are part of this uh, uh, refugee class of Rwandese who had settled in Uganda, were raised in Uganda, joined the army of Uganda. Some like Paul Kagame and including uh, one of my uncles as well, served in this army. One of them that was was actually part of the uh, one of them that actually served as well was the future became the future president and if, and I would say current president of Uganda Yoweri Museveni okay very interesting point so Museveni uh, helps Milton Obote and eventually in 1986 Milton Obote becomes sorry um, uh, Yoweri Museveni becomes himself president or head of state of uh, Uganda shout out to Lisa Jackson thank you my sister Appreciate the super chat. Appreciate that. Galactic, so good to see you. Okay, uh, so Yoweri Museveni becomes uh, uh, comes to power, and 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 this, the way the story goes, and this is this is this is part mythology, but this is also part I say mythology. This is part uh, hearsay, but it's also in reality it's it's manifested itself because Yoweri Museveni is heavily backed, and and many people who grew up in Uganda, if you go to Kampala, people always talk about Museveni as if he's a uh, He's a Tutsi himself. I don't know about that. I've not done enough research in that area, but he is heavily supported by these Tutsi refugees like Paul Kagame. And because they're fighting this sort of bush war, this bush war, they, 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 they create a certain bond, a bond, you know, and this bond obviously allows them to be able to say, okay, you know what? You know, they'll have these conversations in the middle of the night where they'll say, okay, if we get you into Kampala, we get you into leadership, you have to help us get back into Rwanda. And they did. Now, keep this in mind. Hutu power is going on. So this is the 1980s we're talking about. Hutu power in, Ru in Rwanda is at its height. Now, the Belgians, remember, the Belgians had created this division, this class division. They used the phenotypes of African people, African people to demarcate them. If you were tall, slender, you were Tutsi. If you were wide-nosed, slightly shorter, you were Hutu. It's where, I mean, there's the actual videos and footage of them measuring the, excuse me, measuring the heads, the cranium of different human beings to say, OK, we'll classify you as Hutu. So by this point, people carry ID cards. You are a Hutu, Hutu or you're a Tutsi. And if you watch the movie Hotel Rwanda, which is probably the most popular film on the story on the on the subject. Um, but there are others, there are many others. If you read the book uh, Sunday at the Pool in Kigali, if you read uh, Shake Hands with the Devil, Shake Hands with the Devil. Yeah, I think it was. Shake Hands with the Devil. And I think that was made into a movie too. There are different takes of what happens outside the hotel. Okay, the Hotel Rwanda is essentially what's going on in the hotel uh, under a man named Paul, Paul Rosa Sabegina, who is the manager of the hotel, played by Don Cheadle. Played very well by Don Cheadle, I will say. Anyway, long story short, uh, these uh, ID cards are being issued. So everybody has an ID card. And the and the and the there was this this sense of retribution that the Hutus felt, or that some Hutus felt, that we need to get these people back for all these these, uh, these last fifty years of oppression, even though they've been in power, right? And there was always this kind of um, uh, understanding that oh, you know, the Tutsis have, have they take all our jobs, they 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 you know there was also this association with their women that the women are. Uh, whores and all these different types of things like it's, it's you know these, these things that they set up uh i'm not really a fan to to bring up you know uh, jews but what was going on in europe with jews or what would later be used in um in even in russia what happened with jewish people in russia these sorts of things we see manifesting themselves in rwanda so paul kagame eventually goes to a military academy in the usa Right. At this point, we start to see the beginning of what they call the Rwandan Civil War, okay, which lasted from about 1990. It started really about 1990. This Rwandan Civil War, of course, is between these two different factions. Now, the current president at the time is a man called uh, Habirmana, okay, Juvenal Habirmana. 
Okay. And I'll just go to the next slide where I could see. Uh, um, Okay, Lisa, Lisa Jackson, this um, um, from America and descendant of slaves, and I'm looking at Rwanda as my last stop in life. Very good. We're gonna we're gonna come to all the different thing, reasons why Rwanda is a very important place today. But we're, we're going back now to 1940. So let's deal with the genocide. Now there's some images here I want you to see. So I'm gonna just maximize the screen a little bit. Uh, president Habirmana is the president is the man the black man at the bottom right of the image. Now, the guy directly above him is a man called Georges Henri Yvon Joseph Rougeau, a Belgian man. Now, for those of you who saw the film Hotel Rwanda, if you remember, and maybe you might want to go watch it again. If you remember, every time you listen to the radio, there was this constant radio voice sounding where there was a man saying, oh, Hutus, go and kill all these people, go and kill all the Tutsis, cut all the tall trees, which is what they call them, the tall trees. There was this mobilization of Tutsis, uh, the Tutsi militias, everyday people, uh, uh, organizing themselves in, a for in forms of militias, taking names and monitoring Tutsis that lived in the city of Kigali and the various cities, saying to themselves, okay, we're going to get you, we're going to get you. They start stockpiling arms and they start stockpiling things like machetes. Machetes, the long uh, knives that are used for farming, the long uh, blades that are used for farming. They start to stockpile these things in preparation for what they are going to do. Now, Hutu, President Habirmana, like many other presidents, is a Hutu. He's a Hutu man. But he's one who's willing to negotiate in order to end the civil war. Okay, so just a reminder, the ID cards, the rounding up of Tutsis and moderate Hutus, so Hutus who are sympathetic to the Tutsi case. In other words, if you're a Hutu man and you married a Tutsi woman, if you're a Tutsi, if you're a Tutsi uh, a man and you married a Hutu woman, etc., etc. This is these people were being rounded up and seeing, OK, these are sympathizers. OK, very, very similar to what we see in various other uh, situations that occurred uh, around Africa now. President Habirmana is returning from, I believe, Arusha, Tanzania, from a peace accord in order to try and who's agreed to peace. And as he's flying over, and we're talking about the year 1994, in the month of, I, would, I think it's April. Yes, because there's the, there's the film sometimes in April with uh, Idris Elba, which is also about the genocide. His plane is shot out of the sky and he dies. And the in, in Nerhamwe, in Nerhamwe, my mom will kill me for the pronunciation. In Nerhamwe, in Tahamwe is what they call them in the film. The militia, the local militia, under the advice of this white man, this in, this uh, Belgian man, goes on the radio and announces that let's go and cut the tall trees. So I want this to be very made very very clear. In the movie, we hear a voice on the radio constantly, and this is why Hollywood you have to be very very careful about the stories they're telling. In the film, you hear the voice of a black person. But really, the person who was, uh, uh, what is it, RP, RPM, Hutu Power Radio, whatever it was called, Hutu Power Radio, was this white man, a Belgian man, on the radio. He is part and parcel. He's a, he's a descendant of the people who had created this problem in the first place. All the way back in 1916, through the Germans, then the Belgians, and then the uh, Catholic missionaries and creating this division. And now, in the 90s, as these people are about to commit genocide on their own people, he's on the radio saying, go do it. So they, the, 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 the signal was to go and cut the tall trees. Tall trees implying that the Tutsis were the taller people. And of course, I won't go into too much detail, but we know that we saw three months of complete chaos. With the UN abandoning Rwanda. And I want this to be also an important point. The UN didn't give the, uh, the UN army any permission to do any, to, 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 to um, defend. No, no, I think they were only allowed to defend the prime minister. So the Madam prime minister. So when the president was killed, there was a prime minister who was eventually slaughtered in her house, uh, killed in her house. And um, the UN Belgian soldiers that were protecting her were also killed. But all the other UN soldiers, the peacekeeping forces that were there, and there were only a handful, only a handful weren't allowed to shoot. Now, keep that in mind. 
when we see what happens in Yugoslavia later, when we see what happens in uh, Congo, even in the years preceding this, the UN peacekeeping forces, in a way, if you even look at the story of Patrice Lumumba in Congo, the UN peacekeeping forces were essentially the ones that led him to his death. They were there to defend him, excuse me. They were there to defend him and defend democracy. But the UN themselves, the UN de themselves, uh, if you see, uh, I believe it was Madeleine Albright, this is the, this is the reign of uh, Bill Clinton in the United States, where they couldn't even admit that, acts, that genocide was occurring as this thing was going on. They were saying, yeah, we believe acts of genocide occurred. But they were like, and I remember there was a British reporter that said, how many acts of genocide does it take to, to say that it's genocide? How many acts of genocide do you need? And at this point, of course, various newspapers, and, and the movie is good in some instances where it shows some reporters. Uh, Joaquin Phoenix's character goes over there, um, shows some stuff. These things make the news all over the world. I remember being a kid in Nigeria and watching this thing happening in my mother's homeland, and I felt very, very, it just didn't feel like it made sense. No one in the world wanted to do anything about it. I remember if you see even in the movie, the French sent troops to, to, to pick up the uh, Europeans. Those, they were only there to remove the Europeans and they left the Africans to die. In fact, there are some heroes that, was, that were part of the UN uh, Belgian force. Sorry, the UN force in general. They sent peacekeepers from Ghana. Uh, they sent peacekeepers. It was even a Senegalese, uh, I believe his captain, Captain uh, Mbai Jang, I think his name is. Senegalese who even, he died, unfortunately, but he was responsible for, keep, for keeping a lot of people safe. Because you have to understand the brutality of this genocide. These people were drunk on something called Hutu power. They were made to feel that this is some sort of birthright of theirs, where they, were, they could kill these people because these people have done an injustice. These Tutsis have done an injustice to them. They would rape women indiscriminately on the streets. Um, if you read the book, uh, Sunday at the Pool in Kigali, there's a horrible graphic tale of a man who is made... He comes back home, sees that his wife is being, this is the night of the cutting the tall trees. He comes back, sees that his wife is being raped in the street by multiple men. They tell him, okay, you know what? You go, rape, you go have sex with her. So he goes and does it. And they start hacking him and his wife to death. You know, you had brutal stories. I met a girl when I was a kid, a uh, distant relative who, I mean, I don't even know if I should tell this story, but. No, maybe I won't tell the story, but really, really brutal stories of people being buried alive, sending the dogs in to eat them at night. Anybody who was alive, they would come and hack them to death. Dogs would eat them to death. People who had to stay quiet in a hole for, for, day, for those three months because they were trying, they didn't want to alert the animals or anybody else. I mean, we're talking about absolute brutality, the worst of human behavior, which we have seen throughout history all across the world by the way. Now, the three months of violence is occurring. No one is coming. No one is coming to help the Rwandese. No one is, help coming, to, no one to, is coming to help the Rwandese. Uh, but what we know is the... Uh, 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 Kalunda is asking, how, are you sure about Kagame? I'm not talking about Kagame right now. I'm just talking about the history of what is actually happening. We'll get to Kagame in a minute. But what we do know is Kagame was one of the leaders of the uh, uh, RPF, which is the Rwandan, Rwandan Patriotic Front. These, this group of Tutsis who were essentially uh, raised in Uganda and raised in various other parts of that part of East Africa, who came in and were there to, to liberate. They essentially helped to liberate Rwanda. And what we saw immediately after in the aftermath is... Uh, uh, the army and various leaders of the army, but certainly the Interhamway, the militia, the local militia, started to flee Rwanda at the very end. And they went to places like Goma in Congo. Uh, they went to, uh, 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 where else did they go? But mostly to DRC. If you look, if you go back to the map again, DRC is the big country. So uh, let me just show you. So DRC is the big country to the east, sorry, to the west of Rwanda there. That's the big country. So it was where a lot of them fled to. And Congo itself is a very diverse country, very, very diverse country culturally, a um, bit like Nigeria in a way. You know, it has uh, many different ethnic groups, many different groups that are, that are um, what do you call it? Many different groups that are, uh, that inhabit that area, various languages. And so the Hutus, 
uh, uh, moved in to migrate on that, that eastern side of it. Anyway, so post-genocide, what happens? So the Hutus flee, um, and the RPF establish, re establishes a form of government. Now, the first president is actually a man. So if you look at the image, uh, Paul Kagame is on the right. To the left of him is a man called, or to the, to the left is a man called Pastor Bizimingu. Pastor Bizimingu became the president. He's also a Hutu. Okay. Uh, now, they, they went about trying to fix the problem. Now, of course, you found there were numerous orphans. Uh, there were numerous HIV and AIDS victims. There were numerous uh, uh, not just people, children born as, a vict as victims of rape. There were numerous dead. And, 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 and you know, the, 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 the killing that went on, why it was so uh, horrible is essentially people who were neighbors, you know, sometimes even to protect themselves, were forced to kill other people, you know, or forced to point out people for them to be killed, their own neighbors. So how do you go about trying to, how do you go about trying to rectify that sort of situation? The only way you could really do it, but well, no, it's not the only way, but certainly one way that they went about it that was more cost effective was to go about doing the truth and reconciliation. Now, truth and reconciliation they did in, um, in South Africa, as you know, after, after apartheid, where people would essentially come and air their grievances um, and essentially forgive each other. Otherwise, what you would have is a bunch of people having to go into jail, maybe half the population. It's already a small country. It's bitter. And the only way it goes forward is if the, 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 the wounds are healed, if we mend the fences between the people and, and essentially remove the fences, okay? One of the things that they did is they abolished also the whole idea of ethnicity. So this carrying of an ID card saying you're Hutu, you're Tutsi, that was gone, okay? Now, uh, again, truth and reconciliation is a lot more cost-effective. Um, but also what happened was the uh, International Criminal Court, if you remember the International Criminal Court, uh, which was established, I think, headquartered in the, is it in The Hague in, 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 in Holland? I think it's Hague, the Hague in Holland, yeah. The International Criminal Court is, 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 is there and it stepped in to start doing its own work of arresting the, 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 the head honchos. So generals, um, former uh, ministers of cabinet, anybody who that they could link, anyone that they could link as being responsible for either inciting the violence, promoting the violence or harboring the violence. They were started to being they started being brought to the International Criminal Court, whereas everyday people were essentially tried and dealt with locally. Now, the 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 the, the stories about the genocide, the, there's so many people that live today that will talk about it, if you ask them. Um, I recently uh, spoke to a girl I was working on a she just wrote a book, a model here, and actually let I me mean, not even talk too much about that. It's a very private story. Okay, so where are we? So Pastor Bizimingu becomes president. Uh, he's a Hutu, and Paul Kagame becomes his defense minister. Okay, now, uh, uh, eventually, by the year 2000, Pastor Bizimingu, and there are numerous reasons for this, but Pastor, Be Pastor Bizimingu, and I'll let you guys research this yourself, Pastor Bizimingu eventually has to step down as head of state. And in order to finish his term, Paul Kagame steps in. Paul Kagame steps in. So the year 2000, Paul Kagame becomes president of Rwanda. Now, just to, for context, when the year 2023, so 23 years ago, Paul Kagame became president. Now, I want this to be made clear, okay? I am not advocate, I don't advocate for any particular head of state. Um, certainly to be a head of state, even in Africa, is a difficult job. And certainly there will be some level of, uh, how do I put this? vitriol maybe not even vitriol there'll be some level of violence that will be caused as you become president especially in a volatile nation like that which has a history a recent history as bad as that but paul kagame eventually becomes president now in terms of the progress he made as president and this is what i wanted to bring up i just remembered he finishes out the term of Pastor Bizimingo, and technically speaking, he served three political terms. Political terms there, I think, were seven-year periods. Seven-year periods. So in, in essence, I think his term is coming to an end next year, I think, the last term. Now, he served two terms and then went to petition parliament 
to extend, to change the, the, the constitution so that he could have a third term. That was done about six years ago, if I remember correctly, about six years ago. So essentially, he would have stepped down six years ago. But this, of course, adds to this whole storyline that the man is a dictator. And he finished out the term of Pastel Bizimingu, and then he took, and then he eventually ran in two elections, changed the asked to change the constitution, and then ran in a third, a third election. Now, for those of us who are in Nigeria, for those of us who are in places like Uganda, where you essentially have, well, actually no, let me separate the two. For those of us in places like Nigeria, where we've just seen seamless uh, transitions of presidencies over the last twenty-two years, so around this, uh, twenty-four years, twenty-four years, so the same time period. We've gone, from, we've gone from a dictatorship to a, a democracy. Now, over that time period, we have seen decay to our country. Nigeria has gone down significantly by having democracy. Numerous leaders. We had President Obasanjo, Yaradua, Goodluck Jonathan, Buhari, and now Tinubu. Five heads of state in the last 24 years, and our country has gone worse. Conversely, Rwanda, under President Kagame, the Lizzie, good to see you, Lizzie, nice to see you. Uh, but Lisa Jackson, you will know this certainly, I hope, if you've done your research about Rwanda. The reason why people are even talking about Rwanda is because of the success story. Where in the world, in the space of, I mean, it's been nearly 30 years since the genocide, but really 20 years after the genocide, by the year 2014, we were talking about Rwanda's success story. The, const, uh, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the progress they've made in eradicating this racial hierarchy, uh, this racial hierarchy, if you will. The, 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 stri the strides that they make made in developing the nation. This is a, a nation which at the time of the genocide, the currency wasn't worth a damn. Now, all of a sudden, this country has gone on to create all sorts of great things, such as... Uh, I think it's something like nearly 70% uh, of the uh, li uh, sorry, life expectancy has gone up to 70 years of age, nearly 70 years of age, far more than Ghana, Nigeria and South Africa. These are two, 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 two out of the three biggest economies in Africa. It has over 90% access to health care. Even America doesn't have that significantly bigger population, but even America doesn't have up to 90% uh, access to health care. 63% of their women are in parliament or in policy making, uh, policy making positions. It's the fastest growing economy in Africa. Its GDP has grown five, uh, by five times, five times from about $400 uh, per annum to, 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 to 2000 per annum. Rwanda is the talk of Africa as an economy. I've talked about it numerous times on the show. Let's even talk about things that they've done in the tech world. They've created their own mobile phone. Uh, Air, uh, Rwanda Air now flies, I think, two or three flights from London. It's one of the biggest airlines, one of the biggest airline hubs in that part of the world. Let's also remember, they sponsor even Paris Saint-Germain, probably the wealthiest football team in, in, in the world or in Europe. Uh, Arsenal football team currently at the top of the Premier League. I mean, they have transformed this country. The NBA, when they wanted to set up a base in Africa, went to Rwanda. They could have gone to Nigeria. They could have gone to Ghana or any of these places that are popping. But no, they went to a place that was stable. Businessmen, when they want to find a stable economy to operate out of in Africa, they go to Rwanda. Kigali is one of the cleanest cities. Now, I am under no illusions. My mother uh, 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 was, was there recently. I am under no illusions that uh, the, 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 the stories that they tell about Paul Kagame, you cannot criticize him, and so on, are true. I'm pretty sure that, I'm pretty sure that to an extent you can't do it. And there's been a lot of pushback for him. And I think this adds to the whole, the whole story and the whole point of why, we're, why I'm doing this show today, which is, so why is it that the West doesn't like him? Well, one of them, one of them, we have to say, revolves around the DRC, the DRC crisis. Galactic Soul, I hear you, he's 
definitely got bad press. Definitely got bad press. Somebody, Lizzie said, you can sit in the gutter and have lunch. Absolutely. Very clean country. I'm very proud as a Rwandan to be able to say that this is some, this is a, this is somewhere that I can also call, I say as a Rwandan, as a, somebody who's half Rwandan, to say that this is a place that I can call home. But I, we must acknowledge why the Europeans do not like him. Europeans in particular. I want you to see this map very clearly so that you understand. The DRC crisis is significant. Look at that bottom right-hand picture. Those are the Hutus that fled. Those are the Hutus that fled Rwanda when the RPF under Kagame and various other generals came in and liberated Rwanda after the three-month genocide. Those Hutus go to places like Goma, live in refugee camps, assimilate even into the society, and still have skirmishes with Tutsis on the border. This is well documented. Don't take my word for it. Go and do your own research. Lasana Murray, good to see you. Greetings. So the Hutus are there, and there's a crisis there. Now, uh, for those of you who are aware, there's AFRICOM. AFRICOM is a U.S. base. Now, U.S. base is doing pretty much what the Roman Empire did for uh, back in the day, 2,000 years ago, where they were establishing army bases across various places. China is also doing the same thing. It's what imperialist nations do. Now, they are, they are very much aware of what's going on. Keep in mind, Paul Kagame was also trained in the military academy in the United States. Okay, So there's, there's, some, there's some linkage there. One of the things also that Kagame did at the end of uh, when the genocide was over is he decided, I am going to step away from the Francophone world. Remember, Rwanda is colonized by the Belgians. So one of their official languages after Kenya Rwanda, the taught language was Belgian. So if you look at all of them, their first names will be some sort of English or French first name. You look at every Rwandese person, that they tend to have a French sounding or English sounding, same sort of thing, first name. But what he did is he made a pivot and moved away from the Belgians and focused on the English. Now, many people might call this an Uncle Tom move. I think in the world of, uh, in the world of diplomacy, it was, a, it, was a, it was a smart move. He joined the Commonwealth. Okay. Cue the insults. I get it. He joined the Commonwealth, which is obviously chaired by the British monarch, now uh, Charles III, uh, Prince Charles, whatever you want to call him. He's going to be called Charles III. Uh, uh, he joined the Commonwealth for the strict purpose of saying, okay, we're going to pivot and move towards English. So English becomes more of an official language. So now instead of seeing French signs in, across Kigali, you see more English signs. People are there focused People are focused on trying to be more English speaking. Okay. Now that naturally will piss off uh, organizations like La Francophonie, which are, which are organizations, charities, and NGOs that exist based from France and Belgium to an extent. Uh, but have, because remember, France is the gatekeeper of the French speaking world. They are the gatekeeper of the French speaking world. So anything that has French in it, they are involved, even though these people are colonized by the Belgians. So this pisses off France, begins to piss off France. What also begins to piss off, piss off France is they are messing around with the DRC, as is the United States of America. Remember, Mobutu Sese Seko is put in place in power under this, by the CIA, the Larry Devlins of this world, the, the, the CIA bureau chief that was there during the time of Lumumba that saw or made sure that Lumumba was assassinated, along with the Belgians. So they have a stranglehold over the DRC, and it's no, it's no wonder why the DRC is still so chaotic today. Now, remember, so it just, and I, I think I need to do a show about DRC so we could talk a bit more about it. But in the DRC's case, remember, you have the DRC, you have the Lumumba era. These are the people who essentially liberated uh, DRC. Then you have Mobutu Sisiseko, who's a close ally of uh, uh, Patrice Lumumba. He takes over with the CIA help on two different occasions. In fact, murders his friend Patrice Lumumba in the process under their orders. He is then overthrown by a man called Joseph Kabila. Joseph Kabila had been fighting. If you know the story of Che Guevara, Che Guevara goes into Congo, assists Joseph Kabila, but eventually flees because he's like, these guys are not ready for a revolution. But Joseph Kabila later on takes over power, dies around the same time Kagame becomes president, and his son, I'm sorry, I got the names wrong, Laurent Kabila is the father, and Joseph Kabila takes over in 2000 as a 27 or 28-year-old man, became president of Congo. Now, these people are allowed to stay in power despite all the numerous wars in the DRC 
because the US and the French and the Belgians are backing them. But now we have a different conflict in the east of Congo at the border of Rwanda, where these Hutus in these refugee camps that are very unstabilized are now making skirmishes to go back into their country because they feel, okay, these R this RPF, we can defeat them. Who are these Tutsis? We can defeat them. So you have these skirmishes. So immediately, Paul Kagame, with a superior army, or superior army, at least in the context of, of the Indahamwe and the militia, goes and starts to deal with those people on the border. And so now there is a narrative that is being spun by the US, by the Belgians, by the French, that Paul Kagame is going and committing a second genocide in, 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 in Hutu, in, sorry, in Hutu, in, uh, in the DRC. I mean, it's so bad that um, I was at a film festival in Senegal maybe five years ago, and a friend, a guy I, I knew, went and made a, an entire documentary where they were pretty much just Hitlerizing Paul Kagame. Now, this is in line with the Western media's point of view regarding Kagame because he is a sort of person who, aside from the fact of what he's doing in DRC, he doesn't take any nonsense. And this brings me quite swiftly to the next slide. He also took down Rwanda's enemies. Now, one of the things, remember, we brought up the ICC. The ICC was there to trial a lot of the, um, a lot of the, the, the enemies of the Tutsis, or rather the people who were the, the, the figurative the, uh, figureheads during the genocide, who were committing acts of violence, etc. The figureheads, not the everyday people. And what ended up happening is that uh, they were going and sent, telling Kagame, we need this person to come and stand trial in Europe. And he eventually started saying, okay, but what about the Europeans that are involved? What about the Europeans that are involved? What about the Europeans that have been involved that were sending the machetes to, to, to this part of the world? Why aren't we trialing them? Which is something which, if you think about it in theory, this is something which all African states need to start doing a bit more. We tend to, we never really look at the puppet master. We look at the puppet. We never see who is pulling the strings. We never like to focus on who's pulling the strings. And in the case of Paul Kagame, obviously maybe growing up as a refugee, seeing life from a different point of view, was like, no, this isn't right. And he said, okay, well, when you're ready to send your own people here for us to trial them under our own laws, uh, courts, in our own uh, uh, system, then we'll send our own people. So that already starts to piss them off. But what he's also doing is he do, he's doing a very gangster thing. Various, uh, after uh, he took over, there were many people who were still remnants of the old system. There were also many people who were quickly enticed by this Western point of view that worked within his system. And so there were also many who eventually left. Some fled to South Africa, Zimbabwe, various different places. And for numerous reasons, uh, Paul Kagame's, either his secret, secret service, his secret uh, organizations, went and got them back. One of them, including Patrick Karegia who is the, uh, his former spy chief, numerous other stories. And, you know, <laughs> you know, in England, I remember about seven or eight, maybe even 10 years ago, a story breaking out that this man is, uh, you know, going and murdering people extrajudiciously. So the narrative starts being shaped. Now, the, the narrative is also helped by the fact that his closest ally at the time is Yoweri Museveni, the president of Uganda, who he helped he helped come into power in the Bush Wars of the 1980s, overthrowing Obote and putting him in and helping him get into power. Even though he wasn't involved in every aspect of the war, but it, those Tutsis, those Tutsi refugees helped put Yoweri Museveni. Now, Yoweri Museveni has been president of Uganda since 1986. He's, he's won some elections in theory, but extrajudiciously, he has killed, he has... Uh, he has, he, has, he, has, he has dealt with people in different ways. So he's, he's essentially an autocratic leader, dictator. But because of his associ association with Paul Kagame, we paint the two of them with the same brush. But I want to just qualify. Paul Kagame has taken part in three elections, whereas uh, Yuri, Museveni, Yuri Museveni in nearly 40 years, since 1986, that's nearly 40 years ago, has been in power, there have been some elections. There was an election last year, if you remember, where the musician Bobby Wine uh, was a candidate and we saw what happened with him. I mean, it was, it, was, it, was, it was pretty brutal. But one of the people that Paul Kagame dealt with 
quite recently actually, is our good old friend uh, Don Cheadle's character in the movie Hotel Rwanda, Paul Rose Sebegina, the hotel manager at the Hotel Milkolin in, uh, in Kigali. Now, this one, when this one hit the news, I think it hit the news around 2021 during the pandemic, if you remember. For those of you who remember, uh, there was this story about uh, Paul Resusa Begina trying to go to, um, uh, uh, was it Dubai, if I remember correctly, the UAE, and uh, uh, organize an army in order to come and overthrow Paul Kagame. Now, let's just be clear. Uh, if you remember from the movie, Paul Resusa Begina is a Hutu. He married a Tutsi woman. He eventually, after the genocide, after supposedly saving all these people, supposedly, and he had a lot of help. If you study it from history, uh, he had a lot of help um, uh, in the form of uh, uh, Captain Dian, the UN, uh, um, what's the man's name? The, Captain Dian, the Senegalese UN uh, officer who was there, who died, unfortunately, in a car bomb during the genocide. A very popular character, very smiley face. There was a good documentary called Shake Hands with the Devil, which uh, does an interesting piece on him. Shake Hands with the Devil might be on YouTube. You should check it out. So years ago, but it should still be on YouTube. Anyway, uh, uh, Paul Ross is a beginner, is arrested, brought back, and faces trial. That's him in the pink. I don't know if you guys can see it. Let me just make it a little bit bigger. So that's him in the top right, okay, top right image. And then that's him top left, if you notice, him and Don Cheadle. <laughs> anyway, uh, so, so, so he was arrested. And that, of course, sparked a whole bunch of, like, uh, storylines from the West, like, oh my God, this man is out of control, etc., etc. All right. Uh, another one is Diane Rigara, Rigara, uh, who um, I believe uh, her father, I think, was killed in a in a in a in a car accident. I think it was around 2015, and then she went on this whole tirade of blaming Kagame. She was one of the outspoken people. I remember there was even a time that she declared uh, to run for president. A whole bunch of nude pictures were exposed of her and so on. I mean, you know, I'm, 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 I am not excusing the fact that there is some aspect of this man's rule that is like autocratic. I am not disputing that. But when you look at it from an outside point of view, especially when you look at it in context of 1994 versus how the economy is doing now, you have to say, <laughs> you know, I'll take it, you know, but let's, let's move on. So that's another reason taking down Rwanda's leader. Now, the next one is his criticism of the West. I've already touched on this already. His criticism of the West is one of those things which people, people in the West just simply do not like an African leader doing. But in some ways you will see him as the sweetheart of the U S in other, other, other uh, points of view, you will see him as the number one targeted enemy of the European and the EU because of how he chooses to ignore uh, uh, the way things have been done. You have to really understand, I want to emphasize this again, the way France still operates in Africa. I work in film. And um, let's say, for example, in film, the biggest distributor of African film content is a French distributor based out of France. If you watch the cable TV, TV that exists across, across French-speaking uh, uh, West Africa, Canal+, Plus. TV Sank, these are the channels, and uh, I suppose the cable channels, the cable operators, they are French-run organizations. The, the, the currency that they is, is used in French-speaking countries, for the most part, with the exception of Guinea, Guinea in uh, West Africa, nation, land of Secouture, is a French currency. In fact, so crazy that when the euro was created back in 99, 2000, the French currency, for those of you who ever traveled to Paris back in the 90s, the French currency, one dollar was like, I don't know, let's say 150 francs. It was a it was a piss poor currency, as was the lira from Italy, as was the drachma from Greece. These countries in Europe, make no mistake, are bad managers of, of the economy. But somehow the French feel we can go and dictate in Africa what their currency is going to be. So in other words, if I cross the border from Benin to Togo, I use the same currency. If I fly over to Senegal, I use the same currency. If I take a train up into Mali, I use the same currency. All of them backed by France. So you see a Kagame being an outspoken critic of France and all these people will obviously piss them off. 
then of course they create this dictator status for this man. He is someone who is very, very outspoken about the West's involvement in Africa's conflicts. Uh, and he said on numerous occasions, why is it that we have to go to Europe to settle a conflict amongst brothers? Why? And I'm not doubting that freedom after speech is a problem, but it's a problem in most places in the world. And I will say this. I, want, I really want to emphasize this point. We all have freedom of speech anywhere you go. Freedom after speech takes shape in different ways everywhere in the world. But there are always consequences. It might be even in the court of public opinion. You look at the Andrew Tates of the world, for example. Regardless of whether you like what he's saying or not, freedom of speech in theory should not mean that people come at you. Whether or not the man has raped or whatever they accused him of, whatever. But he's standing trial. He's not even standing trial. I don't think there's been a... I'm not even sure if they've actually made an... Uh, they've charged him with anything, but he's in jail for three months. Uh, you look at uh, places like the United States of America, where you expose people, whistleblowers expose people constantly, expose people from, you know, the, 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 the Iran-Contra affair of the 1980s, the, 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 the uh, freeway Ricky Ross story about how drugs are brought into the uh, inner city of, of, uh, of California, how um, even during the COVID, you see these whistleblowers. Look at Edward Snowden. All these people. Now, fine, granted, in the case of Edward Snowden, you know, that is a certain aspect which is wrong because he's, he's I suppose, exposing government secrets. But ultimately, these are people who are saying things that are in the benefit of the society and they are being shut down. So if we see freedom after speech not the same way, if we see freedom after speech having an effect in Rwanda, it's the case everywhere in the world. So let's be careful not to criticize too much. Okay, so those are the end of my slides. And what I want to do quickly is just show you a few videos explaining exactly why this man is a problem. So please, my people, first of all, can I just ask that we get the like button up, please? Give me a one if my internet connection is good. This is bizarre. My internet connection is pretty good today. But give me a one if you're here and please hit the like button. LLW Exotic Wines, shout out to you. Um, I'm just going to quickly play a video. It's about three minutes. It's a compilation that I made of various uh, interviews that he did so that you can see exactly the kind of man that we're talking about. Okay, so here we go. Uh, two aspects. Uh, of and you really, you really need to stop this uh, superiority complex nonsense about human rights. You, you think you are the only ones who respect human rights or others, it's about violating human rights. No, we've fought for human rights and freedoms of our people much better and more than anyone, including you people who keep talking about this nonsense. Where we have taken our country from and where it is now speaks for itself. The rest of the story just comes from this complex. You know, the, 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 these two worlds where there are people who know anything, everything about human rights and all kinds of things, and another world where people are just people who don't know. But these are our human rights. It's not, uh, uh, when we respect the things we respect in our countries, it's not for you, it's not for anybody else, it's for ourselves. Is it not so universal? So you don't see it there. You do, yes, it is universal, but you don't mm. see it there. If it is universal and you believe it, mm. then you don't become the judge yourself. You don't start telling the others what to do, what they should not do, or that they are, what they are doing is not to your satisfaction. Who are you? Well, I'm not Who sure if we're talking about me personally. Well, you are the one actually raising these questions. So I think you better interpret it properly so that it is well understood. Okay. I could see you are asking questions in a manner that you want to influence the ones listening to us, but that's not correct. Okay. Yeah. I'm raising it uh, once again in the context of the United Nations Development Goals. No, United Nations is, is us. You of see, course. United Nations is not something alien somewhere else. Yeah. It's actually us. We participate. And the in framework United for this entire development. And by the way, I had been leading the Millennium Development Goals before Sustainable Development Goals. Mm. I was the co chair of that with other leaders and some of the leaders in Europe. Mm. So you, you, you don't turn around, it's like you want... So you believe that there should be scrutiny on human rights in Europe, in Africa, no, in I believe countries. that you shouldn't be there belittling 
Africans or leaders of Africa who are trying oh, to... Oh, no, but the this. conversation about migration is a real conversation about human rights. So you believe that there are valid human rights concerns to be taken into account in this conversation? Even in Europe, not in Africa. Not in, in Africa. Europe. In Europe. In Europe, not only in Africa. Not, of course. Yes. Well, thank you both very much. I Unfortunately, that is all we have time. Human, don't know what. I tell you, half of my life, I've been living in the trenches, not sure of living to the next day. I didn't fight to be the president of my country. Never. It came by accident, I think. So I was fighting for my own rights, which anyone in any human rights organization could not give me, and even now cannot give me or cannot give Rwandans. So it's, it's, it's cynical and absurd that anyone would just be there talking about the violations, you know, you, me as the leader of my own people to be accused of violating their rights is, is just an absurd insult. So there you have it. And and I want to just like, just, just, just highlight something because some people made some comments there too, which I put up on the screen. I'll talk about them in a second. But you see, uh, Paul Kagame is actually a rare commodity in Africa. We very seldom, I mean, you have President Macky Sall, who sort of dealt with President Obama when he came a few years ago and he said, we have to accept, uh, you know, gay marriage, etc. cetera. Uh, you have Uhuru Kenyatta, former president of, of Kenya and son of the great uh, Jomo Kenyatta, uh, prime minister back in the day of Kenya. Uh, but apart from them, you don't have many leaders who speak their mind. Yoweri Museveni speaks his mind, but the balance isn't there. You see, even those ones that speak their mind, when you compare their nations with Rwanda, it's there's it's 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 there's chalk and it's chalk and cheese. Rwanda is an economy that the world and Africans in particular can be proud of. We can boast that we have a Rwanda. We can boast. For those of you who live in England and watch football, those of you who live in France and watch football, when you see that badge on your favorite football team and it says, fly uh, Rwanda or visit Rwanda, that is, a, that is something which the Rwandan government has said that we're going to try and compete with the likes of Qatar, with the likes of the UAE, in order to try and promote and bring people to our country. We are playing the big boy game at this point. Now, I am not saying that the man's leadership skills and techniques are always going to be the best, but whose are? Whose are? Who is in a position where we are able to say to ourselves, okay, there is a nation we can go to, and there's a leader that would, will fight for us? Speak it from a Pan African point of view. And I really don't think that the vast majority of Rwandan youths are looking at their leader and saying, man, this guy needs to go. He's messing up the country. Certainly, when you look at the 87.5 million people that voted in the Nigerian elections a few weeks, a few weeks ago, yeah, a few weeks ago now, if you told them, take Paul Kagame, who might treat you a little bit harsh at times, but he will develop your nation. He will give you up to 90% access to, to healthcare. He will improve your literacy rate. I'm sure many of us will accept that over what we've got currently. So I just wanted to bring that up just to, 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 to find, uh, summarize. Mark, how are you doing, my brother? Mark, my dad watches Kagame all the time. Something about African leaders who speak to Europeans or Americans with some form of strength really appeals to Africans, even if they're more neocolonial in nature. And that's a very good point. He reminds, and, and, and I will say this, if you go back, Kagame has been consistent in the way that he's spoken. He's never really been one to shy from things, but he's certainly become, I guess, in his old age and the fact that he's at the end of his tenure now, he's speaking a lot more freer. He may not be mentioning names, but I, I don't know if you saw the, pan, the Commonwealth uh, Summit that was held, was it end of last year, I believe, where a, a, a journalist from the BBC, 
a black woman, by the, by the way, African woman from Uganda or Kenya or something, somewhere like that, gets up and starts talking about his record of human rights, because that's another one that they bring up all the time. His record of human rights. And, his re and he basically started to say that, why is it that people in the North, aka the British, the Europeans, etc., feel that it's only them that have rights and we in Africa have no rights? We don't recognize rights. We don't. We need to be dictated to about rights. Really put this woman in a in a place, and it's dealt with. And this BBC point of view, which if you remember uh, during the Zanu PF uh, Mugabe issue about fifteen about fifteen years ago now, that whole election in Zimbabwe, the whole criticism of Zimbabwe by Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister, that whole thing where they nearly went in and committed a coup. When at the same time there was no real uh, condemnation for the fact that Margaret Thatcher, former British Prime Minister's son, was going to places like Equatorial Guinea and trying to have, trying to overthrow presidents, hiring militias. If you watch the movie, uh, what's the movie with uh, Roger Moore? Uh, the movie where they, uh, this British uh, billionaire goes and hires mercenaries, British trained mercenary, mercenaries to go and overthrow this fictional leader in, 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 in somewhere in Southern Africa. Anyway, I can't remember the name of the movie. Really good movie, though, with uh, Richard Burton as well. Anyway, long story short, the point is the condemnation is not consistent, okay? So anyway, that's really what I wanted to talk about. If you have any comments, let's, let's bring them up. Let me just put up some of these again. Lisa Jackson, thanks again for the two super chats. Uh, again, I'm from America and a descendant of slaves, and I'm looking at Rwanda as my last stop in life. I wouldn't put it past you. Remember, I think uh, it's the land of the hills. Okay, so it's a very hilly place. They've got a very thriving film industry. Also, well, up and coming film industry. They call it Hollywood. I don't know why we always copy. Nigeria does Nollywood. There's Gollywood in Ghana. They do Hollywood. I don't know why we like copying, but whatever. They've got a, a, an up and coming film industry. Their tech, their tech world is amazing. They've got a mobile phone. One of my my friends has uh, their mobile phone. Um, Again, the NBA, if you remember, and I put the image of J. Cole. J. Cole went over during the first season to take part in the, uh, uh, I think, I forget which team he was playing for, but it was the essentially the Basketball League of Africa was, is being, it was ta taking place there, the NBA. Uh, okay, a couple more comments. Let me just read them. Uh, so they were debating the definition of genocide. Yes, during the so, so as the genocide is going on, those first few few days, they were this, this uh, the uh, the U.S. Secretary of State, I think Mad Madeleine Albright, and is it the because because what you have to understand also is the U.N. Security Council at the time they were there are five permanent members of the U.N. Security Council, and they always it's the Europeans and the Americans, and then you have these sort of honorary members. Now, just before the genocide. The Rwandese, under a Hutu leader, was, a, was the temporary member. So it's so ironic how things happened shortly after. Uh, anyway, uh, put this comment. It's about leadership. Paul Kagame has had bad press. So Galactic Soul, Paul Kagame has gotten bad press from the West. Absolutely. Uh, uh, where are we? Galactic Soul, yes. This was the comment. M7 Rebels, yes. Uh, Paul Russ is a beginner. Um, okay, where we at? Where we at? Where we at? Okay, Lizzie, they always bring up human rights when they've got nothing else. China, Saudi Arabia, etc. Yeah, absolutely. That's a common theme that they use. This whole concept of human rights, and I, it's funny because um, I remember Paul Kagame was talking about this at that same Commonwealth thing. He was like, "It's funny how we don't even criticize what the Europeans have done to create the chaos that we have." Let's take that DRC situation. The DRC is one of the most cursed places in the world if you will, you know, in terms of uh, the 20th, 19th and 20th centuries. For a start, they go in as the Orange Free, uh, Orange Free State. They go in and are being administered, administered by a man called Leopold II, who basically uses it as a, his private bank, massively oppresses millions and millions, millions of people, cuts their arms off, kills them, etc. For 80 years, the, after the Berlin Conference, they decide, okay, no, 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 Belgium's going to administer this place now, not the king. So for 80 years, they administered this place, uneducate the people, force these people to be in a, 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 essentially niggers, right? For lack of a better word, force them into being niggers, be tr treated like Jim Crow America. And what happens is 
they eventually fight for their liberation. And within two or three years of them fighting for the liberation and being independent, the U.S. and the, U and the Belgians, because they are so arrogant that a man called Patrice Lumumba can criticize the, uh, uh, the, the king of Belgium publicly on his com in his speech during the independence, the Independence Day uh, celebration, they say, you know what? He signed his death warrant. And then you see the many, many years of problems that we see all over Congo. So now it's compounded by the fact that Hutus, who the Belgians had also been essentially supporting to, to a degree, the French, who were supplying the army of the, uh, uh, the, the Rwandan army during the genocide, who was essentially backing the Hutus to an extent, the Hutu into Hamwe, the uh, militia run into Congo to exacerbate the situation in Congo. So you have this big country and this small nation that's thriving. It's a success story. And I believe that when history is told properly, later on down the line, we will look at the story of Rwanda and Kagame as maybe in a similar way to, to the way we look at, say, I want to be careful now, but in the way that people hold, uh, I suppose, Malcolm X in high regard. But I think this will even be more significant because he would have ushered in the example for all African nations. In other words, the black world, how to build something out of nothing. 29 years ago, Rwanda... There's no flight that was going in there. The economy wasn't worth a damn. There were dead bodies all over the place. They were finding dead bodies every single day. And now you fly into their airport. They confiscate your plastic. They, they have their own airlines. You walk, you walk through the cities and you, you're like, how? How? That is a success story. The wild geese. Mark, thank you, my brother. The Wild Geese, Richard Burton, Roger Moore. Uh, this uh, a billionaire tycoon from Britain goes and uh, hires these militias to go and um, uh, remove the head of state and put in place uh, a head of state that had been imprisoned. Funny enough, I have a film similar to that. But anyway, uh, thank you. The Wild Geese, great film. Check it out. So you, if you, so you could see what was going on around the 1980s in particular. How the Thatcher's, the children's, Margaret Thatcher's son, thought in his head that I can go and create, I can go and affect regime change in Equatorial Guinea in the, when was it? Is it the 90s or 2000? I can't remember now. Anyway. Uh, Galactic Soul, he is to Africa as Mia Motley is to the Caribbean. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, in fact, more so. I will say more so. Because we're talking about, you know, we're talking about modern, today. We're talking about when you talk about Rwanda in today's, uh, I suppose, pantheon of African nations that are succeeding, yes, Ethiopia has a small, is kind of coming up. Uh, where else are we talking about? Which other places? South Africa, of course, and so-called Nigeria have these big economies where you can't include them. Uh, there is really nowhere else on the African continent or in the black world that competes with the success rate of Rwanda. But I agree with your point. Uh, probably the closest person is me Motley. Okay, any other comments? I'm going to start rounding up now. Um, again, I wanted to just, um, have you seen The Dogs of War? Absolutely, that's the um, film with uh, Nicolas Cage, yeah. Have you seen The Dogs of War? Uh, Nicolas Cage film about buying arms. You know, these, these rogue business people just going and selling arms. That's a separate, and by the way, that's the Sierra Leone, Liberia. That's another type of thing where we saw a similar thing happening to the, it's not quite similar, but a similar thing happening to what happens in, in Rwanda. But the aftermath is nowhere near as good because the, the leadership never changed. The people might have changed. You look at the Samuel Doe's of this world and the Kevin Johnson. Is it Kevin Johnson? Is that what you call him? Yeah, Kevin Johnson. The mutilation of Samuel Doe on national television. Uh, Kevin Johnson doesn't end up doing anything better. Samuel Doe did the same thing before him. So we are talking about people who essentially leaders that just don't really have that thing in them whereas kagame is somebody that we can hold our heads up high to so my people i appreciate you guys tuning in please hit the like button hit the super chats i appreciate appreciate you guys this is like my third live in a week i haven't done these two you know i haven't done that many ever i think 
Oh, sorry, Lord of War. I'm thinking Do Dogs of War is the one with, uh, thank you, Lord of War, yeah. Dogs of War is based off the Frederick Forsyth book, yeah. Frederick Forsyth is that, uh, Frederick Forsyth wrote uh, Day of the Jackal as well. Remind me, is he Day of the Jackal as well? Yeah, I've seen Dogs of War. Uh, it's that white guy that plays the lead role in Dogs of the Dogs of War. That was in the seventies, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Was that movie made in the seventies? Just remind me about um, Frederick Forsyth wrote uh, Day of the Jackal. Is that right? Just remind me, Mark. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. Is that correct? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for the correction. Lord of War is Nicholas Cage. Dogs of War is the film that was made. Lord, Lord yeah. Lords of Lord of War is more recent. I think two thousand and five. Dogs of War is like back in the seventies. Yeah. Thank you. Brain. It's, it's like midnight for me. Christopher Walken. Thank you, for Christopher Walken. Uh, and just remind me. Yeah. So Frederick Forsyth, great author for this sort of thing. Day of the Jackal is another film that you guys need to check out if you want to understand the French influence. Uh, especially post uh, Algeria, Battle of Algiers is another good film if you want to understand French involvement in Africa and uh, how Africans essentially had to rid themselves of French dominance uh, in Algeria. Uh, uh, um, and Day of the Jackal is essentially about somebody trying to assassinate um, uh, the French Prime Minister Charles de Gaulle, a uh, French President Charles de Gaulle. Uh, also, I have a film called Mona, which I directed, which is about an assassin trying to kill the Portuguese prime minister in the 1970s. Check it out on Quelli.tv. I'll just put that in the chat. www.quelli.tv. It's a feature film that I wrote and directed. Quelli.tv. Uh, I'll just put that in the chat. You know, I don't even promote my stuff, you know. Uh, Quelli.tv, go a film called Mona there. Uh, it's about six or seven years old. Directed it. Multiple award-winning film. Very proud to say that. Um, so check that out. Um, and also, yeah, I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much for your time. I'm going to say peace. Uh, hit the like button on the way out. Please share when you can. And remember those, Mark, I might, I might hit you up actually. I want to do a show about Africans uh, brought up in the US. Uh, probably that'll be the next live that we do. But I'll hit you up, Mark. And anybody else who's interested, Lizzie, Asana Murray, Galactic. So any of you that are in the States, uh, African-born or African parentage, I'd like to speak to you guys uh, on a live. So anyway, peace and love, my people. Take care and see you soon.